Hello YouTube, this is Dr. Mark Havercorn of River City Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in San Antonio, Texas. Back in July, I posted a video of me removing this patient's tooth number 12 and performing a socket preservation bone graft using the PureGraft products. It's been over three months and now it's time to go back and place the implant. I'm showing you some pictures of the healing process just so you can remember this case and what it looks like. Here it is at three months post-op. You can see that we've got a nice wide ridge there uh, and the bone height's been preserved. So let's go ahead and start surgerizing. I'm using a number 15 scalpel blade to make a in crestal incision distal to tooth number 11 right over the top of tooth number 12 or at least the missing tooth number 12. That's a number 9 periosteal elevator that I'm using to lift up a buccal flap. Now right now there's a circular incision around the distal of that canine tooth which just means I made the incision kind of in the uh, little crevice uh, between the tooth and the gums, but I haven't made any distal releases. I'm about to do that though. I'm about to uh, make what I call a, a T release. So I'm just making a little T um, at the distal part of my crestal, mid crestal incision. And what that does is it just lets me lift up that little uh, flap of tissue like you see there. Um, that retractor that we're using is called a Minnesota retractor. Now I'm just going to continue to open up the space and prepare for the implant. Okay, so it's time to put the implant in, and this is our little pilot drill. This is our smallest diameter drill, and what I'm going to do here is just mark the spot where I want the implant to end up, and I will drill a small diameter hole to depth. Notice that we don't spin that burr. I mean, excuse me, we don't spin that drill bit real fast because we don't want to overheat the bone. We don't want to. We don't want to cook the bone and have some of it die back and let the implant get loose. Also notice that we spray a lot of water when we're doing this for the same exact reason. So once I get to the depth that I want, then I'll switch drill bits to a wider diameter drill bit. And we just keep switching drill bits until we've got the diameter, until the hole is the diameter that we need. Before I widen that hole very significantly, I'm going to use this little metal pin called the paralleling pin to just check the angulation of the hole and make sure I like it. And what I did there was just to close her mouth and make sure that that pin hits the lower teeth in the position that I want the final implant to hit the lower teeth. Now I've got the next widest drill bit and I'm going to just widen the osteotomy. We've already got the hole to the depth that we want, so we just need to widen it like I said before. Notice that all these drill bits have stripes on them. Those stripes are measurement lines. They tell us how deep we're drilling and they're done in millimeters. Also you may notice that gauze in the back of the patient's throat. That's there for two reasons. Probably the biggest reason is that it soaks up some of the water that the suction misses so that the patient doesn't start coughing, but also it's there in case we drop one of these little implant parts so that the patient doesn't swallow it. We can grab it before they swallow it because it'll hit that gauze instead of hitting the back of their throat. Here's the actual implant ready to go in. If you pay attention, we're going to spin that drill even slower than we did with the drill bits for the same reason that we don't want to overheat the bone. We don't want to over compress the bone. And then also if we go slow, it just gives me time to make sure I like that position. Here's a close-up still photo of the implant. You can see that it's placed just below the bone. All right, now I'm gonna put the uh, screwdriver on the implant, and I'm just doing this to check the position of the implant. Can you take a couple like still photos of it? So you can stop the video. And... Oh yeah, you can do that too. You're better at it than I am. <laughs> Is that a good view or do we need to pull back any? Like, or do we need to retract better? That's good. Cool. Yeah. Let's put the 
we're gonna put the cover screw on the implant, which is a screw that goes in the implant and just seals up that hole right there, seals up the inside of the implant. The cover screw sits flush with the top of the implant, flush with the bone. You will not see it in the mouth. Any post that we put on top of the implant permanently or semi-permanently that sticks through the gums is called an abutment. And you can put what's called the healing abutment on the implant right now. The healing abutment is just a cylinder. It's a cylindric piece of metal that screws into the implant and sticks through the gums, usually just barely through the gums, to make a hole in the gums, a permanent hole in the gums to give access to the implant. The healing abutment does not look like a tooth and it's not supposed to look like a tooth. Now you can put the healing abutment on right now, like I said, but I've gotten to the point where I'm very conservative about that. Um, it's really popular in implant dentistry to go as fast as possible and make the patient wait as little as possible and do the fewest amount of surgeries as possible. But I've just found that you get a little better result if you can slow down and be a little bit patient. So we're going to completely cover this implant with gums. The patient won't, won't be able to feel it. You won't be able to see it. We're going to let it heal two or three months, and then we're going to come back and put a healing abutment on it. And honestly, this implant was fairly tight. Uh, and went in really nicely. So really, we probably only need to let it heal two months. Then I'll put a healing abutment on it. The gums will heal for about two weeks around that abutment so that they've got a nice hole through them. And then her dentist uh, can make an impression of the implant, have the crown made, and come back and put the crown on, you know, one or two, one or two weeks after the impression. Now I'm just closing up that wound with some 4-0 chromic gut suture using interrupted stitches. I'm not a big fan of running stitches. Uh, I just prefer the, the interrupted ones, um, you know, in particular, just so that if one or two of the stitches falls out, the whole wound doesn't open up. And I am using a cutting needle. I know you've probably heard me criticize using cutting needles before, but in this tough attached tissue that the patient has, there's nothing wrong with a cutting needle. You know, Molly that does our credit card processing, mm -hmm. she commented on the last video on Facebook or something. I was like, you know, I, was try I thought I'd have this like real fancy educational YouTube channel, but no, nope, it's just pus. <laughs> <laughs> what everybody likes. <laughs> yeah, whatever gets you that go from. Yeah, that's basically what she said. Like, that's the end of the surgery. Now the patient just needs to wait two to three months for that implant to heal. We'll put a healing abutment on the implant, and then she can get her tooth made. Well, guys, that's the end of the video. This is Dr. Mark Havercorn with River City Oral Surgery in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the video. That really helps us out. Special thanks to the patient, as always, for letting us film this. And if we can help you out, give us a call, 210-778-0002 for River City Oral Surgery.